Good evening, everybody. Indian College is signing in to the Wednesday webinar. The College Chief Executive Officer, Dr. Deshri Sue, will be introducing the chairpersons and the speakers. Dr. Deshri, kindly uh, go good ahead. Evening. Uh, thank you, Dr. Radhakrishnan. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, so yet again, we are going to have another webinar all on the respiratory system. And uh, today we have a very interesting topic that's on non-invasive ventilation uh, following the others, which we had previously. And uh, today I would like to introduce the moderators. We're very honored that we have the same moderators that we had last week. Dr. Nibidita Pani and Dr. Sunil. Dr. Nibidita Pani is the Professor of Anesthesiology at Katak Medical College. She was the past Vice President of the National ISA. Needless to say, she has many, many awards to her credit, many orations. She has delivered many orations and of course, lectures in the national conferences. She has several publications, both national and international. Uh, she is very interested in obstetrics, pain, critical care nowadays with the COVID. Very good friend of mine. The other moderator is Dr. Sunil. He was here last week as well. He's the professor of the Department of Anesthesiology at the Sri Chitra Institute at Vandrum. Thank you very much. And they will be moderating this session on non-invasive ventilation. Could I request Dr. Nibidita to please introduce the first speaker? Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. And uh, first of all, let me also give a pranam to Dr. B. Radhakrishnan, sir. Uh, I'm just uh, honored to introduce the speakers. Dr. Pradeep Rangappa, he has done his DND uh, from the St. John's Medical College Hospital. And he's also a fellow of the Joint Faculty of Intensive Care Medicine, Australia. He has done his also EDIC, European Diploma of the Intensive Care. He has done his fellow of College of Intensive Care Medicine, Australia. He has done postgraduate diploma in the perioperative and intensive care echocardiography in the University of the Melbourne. He's a master of the business of the admission in healthcare science. He's a fellow of the Indian College of the Critical Care Medicine. And he's a postgraduate diploma in medical law and ethics, National Law School, University, India. He is now consultant of the intensive care physician of the Columbia Sir Referral Hospital, Bangalore. He's the secretary of the ICCM Bangalore chapter. And he's a past South John member of the ICCM. He also passed accreditation secretary of the Indian College of Critical Care Medicine. And he's also the organizing secretary of critical care medicine, Zapio in 2016. So, I request you to kindly deliver it yourself. Yeah, thank you very much, ma'am. Uh... Yes. So are you, I hope you're all hearing me. So I'll be taking you through this uh, current practices of non-invasive ventilation. So I wish to thank Indian College of Anesthesia, Professor Dr. Radhakrishnan and Sanish in having me this evening. So I'll take you through the whole concept of NIV and what is the current prevailing evidence for this NIV and uh, where does it uh, stand its utility in the intensive care and uh, we'll take it from there. Yeah, so I think when the NIV uh, first came around in around 1936, if you see this, way back in 1936, this article was published in Lancet by UK people. And this was the sort of a NIV modality they used by using a vacuum cleaner. So they used a Hoover vacuum cleaner and tried to deliver this positive pressure. And from there on, it has evolved itself into one of the important modalities uh, in intensive care as a very life-saving measure. So what, what do we mean by non-invasive ventilation? So basically, it is the, our uh, ability to provide ventilation to the lungs uh, using techniques without putting the tube into the throat and without an endotracheal tube. So basically, it does everything 
that one would wish to do in ventilating the patient, but without uh, putting a tube into the throat. So, so that's typically an NIV. And what are the concepts of NIV? So if you look at the physiology of NIV, it is extremely important to understand how this NIV works. So basically, if you look at the lungs, uh, NIV helps in improving the alveolar ventilation. And most importantly, it helps to recruit the alveoli. So uh, that is the critical element of uh, you know, circumventing the respiratory failure we see in ICU. And another important aspect of non-invasive ventilation is it reduces the work of breathing. And that is also extremely important aspect when we're dealing with patients with respiratory failure. And the fourth important thing is it reduces the afterload in the heart by providing positive pressure ventilation. And this is extremely, extremely important in cardiac failure and patients with pulmonary edema. And it also helps in stabilizing the uh, chest wall uh, muscles in case of any trauma we are dealing with any respiratory failure. So, so it has a multimodal effect. It is just not providing positive pressure. So it has various modalities which helps in reducing the work of breathing, reducing the afterload, improving the alveolar ventilation, recruiting the alveoli, and stabilization of the chest wall muscles. So when you look at the physiology in NIV, we need to understand certain equations, although it appears a little complex, but I'll try to simplify it. So the whole respiratory effort of the muscles that we call it, it is derived as P must. We call it as the complete respiratory effort that is needed from the muscles. And uh, any respiratory effort has to overcome three pressures. So it has to overcome the elastins, uh, which we call it as PEL, and it has to overcome the resistance and it has to overcome the threshold pressure. So the overall work of the respiratory system should overcome these three pressures, elastic pressures, elastins, resistance, and threshold pressure. And, uh, and there is something called airway opening pressure, which it needs to overcome. So in, in simplified version, the whole uh, respiratory effort is uh, dependent on overcoming the elastins of the airways. And it is important to deliver adequate volume. And it is important to overcome the resistance of the respiratory system. And it is important to uh, able to overcome by adequate inspiratory flow and by providing ins inspiratory peep. Uh, so these are the uh, typical pressures that we need to overcome when we are de delivering NIV. So elastins, resistance, and intrinsic peep is something that we need to uh, provide when we are providing NIV. So what are the types of non-invasive ventilation? I'm sure all the listeners would have heard of various nomenclatures like CPAP, pressure support, BiPAP, NIPPV, non-invasive positive pressure. So these are all used with a complex interplay. Uh, but what the audience need to remember is the CPAP and the BiPAP, which are very commonly used, and pressure support ventilation. So these are the three uh, common modalities we use in ICU, and we use it with a sort of a complex interplay many a times. And what basically uh, NIV does, as you would know, uh, so by recruiting the alveoli, so it reduces the, it overcomes the elastance of the uh, airways. And by providing intrinsic peep, it reduces the threshold pressure. So these are the pressures that are needed to overcome the elastance and to overcome the threshold pressure. And the important ability of the NIV is to, it reduces the shunt fraction that typically shunt is where uh, you have this blood uh, which is not participating in the uh, airway exchange at the alveolar level. So your NIV typically acts by, rec by recruiting alveoli, it reduces the elast uh, uh, elastic pressure. And by providing intrinsic peep, it reduces the threshold pressure and it reduces the shunt fraction. So the CPAP, what we typically use are typically is providing PEEP. And this particular modality is we use in pulmonary edema and pneumonia, where our whole effort is to uh, provide the intrinsic PEEP to reduce the threshold pressure and to recruit the alveoli. So how does this act? So when we, uh, when we what, do, what do we mean by uh, positive uh, pressure support ventilation or uh, inspiratory pulmonary artery, uh, uh, inspiratory uh, positive airway pressure? So when we provide pressure support ventilation, what it means is it increases the alveolar tidal volume and it helps in producing surfactant from the alveolar epithelial cells and that helps in improving the tidal volume. So by increasing the alveolar tidal volume in pressure support ventilation, we, we, we are able to reduce the CO2. So when we say we are providing pressure support in NIV along with the PEEP, so PEEP recruits the alveoli and it overcomes the threshold pressure. But when we, pro when we provide pressure support ventilation or inspiratory positive airway pressure, we are increasing the alveolar tidal volume. When we increase the alveolar tidal volume, our whole effort is to reduce the PSCO2 or uh, CO2. And this typically is needed for COPDs, where your carbon dioxide is high 
and you have to increase the tidal volume to reduce the CO2. And by providing pressure support ventilation or inspiratory positive airway pressure, we are able to reduce the elastance pressure and the resistive pressure. So it is. So this is the physiological concept as to how NIV helps in overcoming certain pressure. So to simply uh, for the audience to remember, you have to remember three pressures. One is intrinsic PEEP, one is the threshold pressure, one is the elastance pressure. So our whole effort in NIV is to modulate and overcome these pressures to uh, help in adequate ventilation. And together, it reduces your overall respiratory effort and your ability to improve oxygenation. So when we say BiPAP, so BiPAP is basically you are providing both inspiratory positive airway pressure and you are providing expiratory positive airway pressure. When we when we say we are providing CPAP, it means we are pretty much providing only the PEEP. But when you say when you're providing pressure support, we add pressure support to increase the alveolar ventilation to increase the alveolar tidal volume so that you have an ability to reduce the CO2. So that is what we mean. So BiPAP should always be accompanied by inspiratory positive airway pressure so that we increase the tidal volume and reduce the CO2. So that is the whole concept of IPAP. But when we say CPAP, it is mainly with pulmonary edema where our whole effort is to only provide the PEEP to recruit the alveoli and to provide the PEEP to overcome the threshold pressure. So this is what is our understanding. So what are the indications of bilevel? As I said, the CPAP we typically use for pulmonary edema and pneumonia or respiratory failure. When we talk about BiPAP, because we are giving inspiratory positive airway pressure, our intent is to reduce the CO2 by increasing the tidal volume. So the conditions typically we use is chronic uh, obstructive uh, pulmonary disease, COPD, asthma, or even in respiratory failure where tidal volumes are low. So what are the contraindications for NIV? So when we are using NIV, we need to understand there are certain contraindications. So if the patient is very obtended, he's unable to bring out the secretions, or if he has upper airway obstruction, then we cannot provide NIV. Or if someone is in an acute bronchospasm, NIV is contraindicated, or someone who has a pneumothorax, we cannot provide NIV unless the pneumothorax is drained. Or someone who has a low GCS is unable to protect the airway, we cannot provide NIV. Or someone is very hemodynamically unstable, where blood pressure is very low or very fluctuant, very volatile, we cannot provide NIV because it can compromise hemodynamic status and uh, it is not safe. So these are some of the uh, contraindications that one can keep in mind. So what are the complications of NIV? So there are around uh, very simple, uh, you know, minimal complications. So predominantly, as you see, if someone has a glaucoma, it can increase intraocular pressure and it can cause dryness of the mouth. It can cause nasal congestion. Aspiration is one of the risks, especially when you're using BiPAP uh, in, or a non-invasive ventilation in someone who is obtended or someone who is hemodynamically unstable hypotension. Uh, there also we, we, we can have issues with NIV, but that's a relative contraindication. If someone has a head injury and where you suspect there may be raised intracranial pressure, and this is a situation where you would not want to uh, consider NIV because it may increase the intracranial pressure. So these are some of the relative contraindications uh, of the complications. And, and discomfort and intolerance and claustrophobia, some patients are very intolerant to NIV. They become very restless, agitated. Uh, so someone is not cooperative. We see distinctly some group of patients who just cannot keep NIV when we offer them. Uh, so, uh, so these are certain groups where uh, we may have to go ahead and intubate. So these are some of the complications of NIV and gastric distension. So anyone who is on NIV, it is important they have a Riles tube because you are pushing in so much of air with positive pressure. So there is a risk of uh, gastric dilatation and uh, bloating. So gastric dilatation is something that can common. So we always uh, prefer to keep a Riles tube to aspirate the air from the stomach when we are providing NIV. So these are some of the simple complications in NIV. But the, all, most of these complications could be overcome by simple maneuvers. Uh, so what are the key equipments that one need in NIV? So I think one needs to be aware there are around six checklists in NIV. So we need a walled oxygen. So typically when we talk about NIV in ICU, it is not the home CPAP or home BiPAP. These are all... Uh, industrial ventilators we use for NIV for sick patients. So uh, seldom we have uh, doctors getting confused with home using home CPAP or home BiPAP machine for ICU. So we, we are never meant to use this home BiPAP because these are not for a sick patients. When we use NIV in ICU, we use it with proper ICU ventilator where we are able to adjust FiO2, we are able to adjust the uh, pressure support, we are able to adjust the PEEP. 
And so we need to have a walled oxygen to provide high flow. And we need to have an interface, the masks that, uh, that is an interface between the machine and the patient, which needs to be adaptable and the size should be suitable for the patient. And if you are using a single limb, uh, sort of a circuit for NIV, then the expiratory port should have a resistor, which can be a flow resistor or threshold resistor to adjust the desired peep that we intend to keep. But most of the time in our ICU or in an ICU, when we are using a conventional ventilator, we use two limbed circuit so that the peep is sort of titrated on the ventilator itself. And the length of the tubing is desirably to be kept smaller to reduce the resistance and, uh, and the width also to be wider so that the airflow is more seamless and a very variable FIO2 can be provided. And there should be flow and pressure sensors to detect the FIO2 that you are delivering, to detect the changes in the tidal volume, to detect the changes in the pressure. And it's very important, even when we are using NIV, to consider humidification process. So we intend to have HME filters or uh, uh, heated humidifiers to be connected so that humidified air is delivered. And it is important that the NIV circuit has ability to connect the nebulizers. So these are jet nebulizers. And as you see here, this is the vibrating mesh nebulizer because uh, many of many a times these patients need some sort of a nebulization. So it is important that circuit should have adaptability to connect to the nebulizer. So these are some of the checklists that we keep. And any NIV ventilator, like any other ventilator, should have a backup battery and backup apnea sort of a setup so that there is an auto trigger that happens. So these are some of the a uh, checklist of equipments that one needs to bear in mind when you are using an NIV in a typical ICU patient. So uh, the important point is uh, the home BiPAP or home CPAP are not meant to be used for ICU. For ICU, we use a conventional ICU ventilator where all these checklists are mandatory when we are providing NIV to the patients. So what are the typical ventilatory settings? So when we provide CPAP, as I said, CPAP is providing PEEP. And um, this is typically in patients with cardiac failure or cardiogenic pulmonary edema or some of the pneumonias. We usually start with a, a CPAP of 5 to 8 and uh, we could slowly crank it up as per the need of the patient up to 10 to 15 centimeters of the water. And when we set up the CPAP, it is extremely important to look at the tidal volume on the ventilator because you, you have to be achieving good tidal volume. If tidal volume is not being achieved, then it means that they need some inspiratory pressure support which, or IPAP or pressure support that needs to be given to increase the tidal volume. And once CPAP is provided, patient should settle down, his uh, tachypnea should come down, respiratory rate should come down, and patient should start feeling comfortable. And NIV, when we initiate, our whole task starts from the initiation because we need to follow through after initiation to see if the NIV we are providing is adequate for the patient and patient is getting better. And masks should be held gently and, and patient has to be explained what we are doing. Otherwise, they'll become very intolerant and resist the NIV. And FIO2, you could start away uh, like how we intubate when we put up FIO2 at 100%. Even in NIV, you can start up with 100% and then titrate it to the patient's need and try to maintain saturation more than 90%. And it's always important to keep the uh, peak pressure less than 25 to 30, like in any intubated and ventilated patient. So... The whole essence of NIV is once we put the mask, we cannot put the mask and walk away from the patient. So the key essence is to see whether patient is adapting to the ventilator settings and is getting more comfortable or uncomfortable. If they're getting uncomfortable, then we need to put in certain measures uh, to tweak certain uh, settings to make him feel more comfortable. So in COPD exacerbation, when we put them on NIV, there are certain key parameters we look. We see whether... PH is getting better. So in COPD, our whole aim is not to normalize the CO2, but to normalize the pH. So we aim at pH getting normal. And obviously, at the same time, you would see if CO2 is coming down. And most importantly, this work of breathing should start coming down. And we give a sort of a time frame of four to six hours to see if these changes are happening. And in COPD, it is shown that use of NIV reduces hospital length of stay, reduces the mortality, and reduces intubation rates. We'll look into certain studies into this. And the success rate of NIV in COPD is 80 85%. And use of NIV in COPD is a quality indicator to the point that we are not meant to intubate. We should always give a trial of NIV before we go ahead and intubate the COPD patients because remarkably they show good response to the NIV and they start getting better most of the time. Even when we've had patients, I'm sure most intensivists would know, we have patients coming with CO2 of 100, 110, but we don't straight away intubate. If they're able to protect airway, we give them a trial and many a times they do succeed. 
so as i said the use of niv is a structure indicator in icu it's a quality indicator so this is some of the data from in our own hospital we did where uh, the typical situations where we use niv is uh, cardiology we used around 27% we just did an audit and respiratory we used around 40% in sepsis we used for 19% so 95% of copd exacerbation should get niv trial and that is a quality which means if you are not offering niv and straight away intubating it is a breach in the quality so this is what i uh, wish the uh, listeners to bear in mind that any copd patient should get a trial of niv before we go ahead and contemplate intubation and what are the ventilatory settings in copd so we put in spontaneous or time mode as i said in copd we give inspiratory positive airway pressure and inspiratory positive airway pressure increases the tidal volume by increasing the alveolar tidal volume you are you have ability to reduce the CO2 levels and it helps in some surfactant production also from the lungs and we keep typically IPAP at 12 to 15 and expiratory positive airway pressure at 4 to 5 and trigger we keep at maximum sensitivity and then we sort of reduce so if patient is very obtended uh, so we keep uh, maximum sensitivity and if a uh, patient is very restless we keep a low sensitivity and the backup rate should be kept at around 15 breaths per minute in a patient who is obtended so these are the typical copd and then we have to titrate ipap sometimes we go up on ipap up to 20 22 24 to make sure that adequate tidal volumes are achieved to reduce the co2 and the backup ie ratio like any other ventilator we keep at 1 is to 3 so when when we are setting it up for niv it is important to see if there is any contraindication like i said if someone has a pneumothorax which is not drain then we cannot give niv if someone is an acute bronchospasm we cannot possibly give niv at that point of time we need to reduce the bronchospasm and then only we should give and in between see niv when we put a mask there is often instances where the mask has to be removed maybe to feed the patient or to give him some breaks during the breaks you would very often see nurse not putting them on oxygen it is very very important in between any sort of a time lag where the niv mask is removed for any reason patient should be connected to some sort of an oxygen because they get overtly hypoxemic when someone is on niv and constant reassurance is always needed for niv because patients get very agitated they wouldn't know what is happening there is a blast of air which is uh, throwing up on the face and it becomes very uncomfortable so lot of nursing sort of a uh, diligence is needed nursing reassurance is needed so that patients are taken into confidence that whatever you are giving is to help them better and most important is putting a right mask so the mask size has to be adequate if you put a oversized mask or undersized mask then your whole ventilation gets affected after we put the mask it is very very important we monitor observe and regularly assess the patient so the whole work of niv starts after we put initiate niv the work for a nurse for a doctor gets even more because we need to monitor the trends if patient is responding to niv and getting better because if they are not responding then we have to move ahead and go and intubate because that is the whole sense niv is a sort of a bridge you are trying to offer this niv and see if you can get him out of the crisis if the patient is not winning then obviously we have to intubate so we cannot allow the patients to deteriorate on niv i think that is the key essence and when we are putting on a mask so there are certain key elements of the mask so you should have this swivel connector which can rotate 360 because patient will be moving his head all around and mask should be able to remain in place with a swivel connector which has a 360 degree movement and you should have a foam so often you would have seen friends that when you put on niv you have a lot of erosion of the nasal bridge and you have a lot of ulcerations on the face so it is very important to be sensitive to having this soft foams so that this the pressure sores are avoided on the nasal bridge you would have seen typically an icu patient coming out with a nasal bruises so we as much as possible we should use this foams to and minimize this a uh, sort of a injuries to the bruises to the face and so these are some of the features of the mask so they have this ball and socket clip and they have a pressure pick off port so there are various little little uh, nuances within the mask uh, as a sort of a, uh, as a as a features uh, for adequate ventilation and uh, i'm sure with the covid uh, which has come so there has been a renewed emphasis on using this helmet mask because this helps in patient to reduce the claustrophobia and uh, it helps in uh, it it helps in reducing the aerosol generating procedures when you are doing aerosolization can be minimized so especially in covid uh, this caught on with popularity worldwide in using this helmet mask so this is something one could consider in this covid situation so once we initiate uh, niv it is very important to see whether 
his take patient's tachycardia is coming down heart rate should settle down his oxygenation should improve and usually when they are very distressed in respiratory failure so there will be a tachycardic and uh, there will be a uh, hypertensive response so we should see that blood pressure should start settling down and respiratory rate should start coming down and one should look at the accessory muscles of breathing if they are getting any better and if patient is obtained that with type 2 respiratory failure they should have improvement in the mental status and they should have when what we call as respiratory mechanics they should have a coordinated muscle movements and patient should feel lot more comfortable and there should be uh, he should start feeling better and there should be reduced shortness of breath so these are some of the key things that we need to monitor even in covid in our uh, whatever protocols we follow every nurse is sensitized on once we initiate niv these are the changes they need to see the patient should start feeling better his tachycardia should come down his blood pressure should start settling down his tachypnea should come down his work of breathing come down and it's very important to keep monitoring blood gases at least 4 to 6 hourly to see if oxygen is improving carbon dioxide is coming down ph is getting better and acidemia is getting better so these are some of the things so one has to remember that niv can fail that we start niv that but patient may not respond to niv so that is when you should have a backup plan that you may have to intubate so when would you think that niv is not working obviously when patient is deteriorating on niv or there is a worsening arterial blood gas with oxygen coming down or carbon dioxide going up or acidemia getting worse or patient not tolerating very often we see one of the first imminent sign of niv not working is patient having absolutely no cooperation or compliance if patient is very restless not complying he is pulling out the mask then you absolutely know that this patient is not going to get better on niv and then you have to plan for possible intubation we see this as a very very important prognostic marker when we initiate niv even in covid we have a covid patient who is pulling out the mask not cooperating then we have to think of intubation because he's not going to do well when he is pulling out because he'll get derecruited and whatever good has happened with ventilation will be undone with his uh, non cooperation so criteria to discontinue niv the first criteria is patient pulling out restless not tolerating despite all your efforts you have to go ahead and intubate and if patient's oxygen is not improving or patient is getting more hemodynamically unstable or patient develops arrhythmia so these are the situations where you have to abandon niv and then consider intubation so withdrawal of niv means once patient is getting better so when patient is clinically improved his tachypnea is settled his heart rate is settled ph is gotten better and saturations has improved and he is needing about less than 40% and you know that you can wean off niv and put him on mask oxygen and give him intermittent niv so not always niv niv has to be given continuously we can give a short break of one or two hours in between so that uh, patient can communicate patient can eat and patient will feel lot more uh, comfortable and he becomes lot more compliant so that is the whole essence of how we use niv so let us now look at the scientific aspect whether niv really makes a clinical difference so there are a lot of studies so i'll just take you through the key important studies so in copd bipap has been compared to pressure support ventilation and bipap has shown to be superior to pressure support ventilation in improving gas exchange and reducing the work of breathing so this was a big meta analysis that came from australian group looking in cardiogenic pulmonary edema they compared cpap with bipap so this was a study where meta analysis of 23 randomized controlled trials and they found with regards to mortality and intubation rate there was no difference between cpap and bipap but mortality and intubation rates were lower in these two groups when compared to the standard group so this was another study in 200 patients where they compared between cpap and pressure support ventilation see mind you in cardiogenic pulmonary edema what they need is the peep they may not need pressure support because pressure support is inspiratory positive airway pressure you give with an intent to increase the tidal volume to reduce the co2 you don't need this so they have found no difference but shortness of breath resolution was earlier with pressure support and these are some of the studies that has come from france italy and us where mortality has been shown to be low in non invasive ventilation as compared to mechanical ventilation in patients with cardiogenic pulmonary edema and the infection risk was significantly less in niv and intubation rates reduced by 20% when they were given a trial of niv in pulmonary edema so what about copd so so we put it this was a big study that came from uk group meta analysis of 14 randomized controlled trials with 758 patients as you see when you compare niv with standard therapy in copd mortality was almost halved when you gave niv and treatment failure was 20% when compared to 42% 
and intubation rate was 16% compared to 33% when we gave NIV as compared to standard therapy and hospital length of stay also was significantly lower in COPD. And in cardiogenic pulmonary edema, uh, so this was another study where they did meta-analysis in 13 randomized. So mortality with use of CPAP was 10.3% compared to 15.8%. Uh, and this was another study where they compared uh, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation with standard. Even here, they showed a significant reduction in mortality when uh, CPAP was used in patients with pulmonary edema. So, so that was about the studies in COPD. We saw that uh, use of NIV did, uh, was uh, very useful in reducing the mortality, even, even so it was the case in cardiogenic pulmonary edema. How about in hypoxemic respiratory failure? Hypoxemic respiratory is typical pneumonias. So this was a study from UK group, meta-analysis of eight randomized controlled trials. They found use of NIV in mild to moderate respiratory failure due to pneumonia showed an absolute risk reduction of 17% with the use of NIV. And intubation rate, there was a 23% absolute risk reduction with the use of NIV. So even in mild to moderate pneumonia, one could give a trial of NIV. And that can, if and patients are responding in many attempts in COVID, I think COVID situation is a typical scenario where in mild to moderate ERDS in COVID, many of our patients uh, get better and do well when we provide NIV and we don't jump and intubate because the mortality in COVID patients once we intubate is very, very high. So, and many of our patients do well on NIV and HFNC with uh, Dr. Jose will talk. And this was another study from Spain. Again, they looked in uh, pneumonia cases. As you see, eight, uh, the ICU mortality was 18% compared to 39% in standard and intubation rate was 25% as compared to 52. So these are some of the studies highlighting that even in pneumonia respiratory failure, your NIV is significantly helpful. This was another study from US. Again, showed hospital mortality uh, was 60% and intubation rate came down by 64% as compared to the standard. So what about in immunocompromised? So in immunocompromised patients, even the use of NIV has shown to reduce the ICO mortality, reduce the ICO length of stay, reduce the intubation rate. And we need to understand there are certain predictors for NIV failure. So if someone is hemodynamically unstable and is getting having increasing inotrope requirement or vasopressor requirement, so that is a situation where NIV may not be safe and you may have to intubate. And someone who is on renal replacement therapy, studies have shown that Patients on NIV not necessarily may be doing well, but what is the most important predictor that studies have identified is if there is a delay, if there is an increased lag time in initiation of NIV from admission, from the patient getting admitted, in whom otherwise NIV, like suppose you have a cardiogenic pulmonary edema, you don't offer NIV at the outset, and there is a significant delay, that is one of the important reasons where NIV can fail. That's why very often you would see in emergency rooms in this day and age, that any patients with pulmonary edema, respiratory failure, NIV is started even in the emergency so that there's no delay in initiation. So delay in initiation is one of the predictors of NIV failure. And what are the other conditions where NIV is used? Post-extubation, uh, where you anticipate that they may fail, you use, and pre-intubation for, uh, for uh, optimizing the lung reserves, even in, uh, they have used NIV in the pre-oxygenation in OT settings, and intubation refusal, like end-of-life situation, elderly man, uh, where patients have expressed the wish that they would not want their dear one to be intubated. That is also a situation where one would produce NIV. So the summary and recommendation, last slide. So NI, when we say NIV or NIV uh, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, it's ventilation by non-invasive means by not putting a tube inside the throat. And uh, as per all the evidence, there is grade 1A recommendation, strong recommendation and good evidence for use of NIV in COPD. As I said, COPD not using NIV is a breach in the quality indicator. 95% of the COPD patients that get admitted to any hospital should be given a trial of NIV before you contemplate intubating. So that is the key essence. And grade 1A recommendation, strong recommendation, good evidence for cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So if you have a patient coming with heart failure or pulmonary edema, we should not jump and intubate. Give a trial of NIV, that is a quality indicator and grade 1A recommendation. If you have a patient with pneumonia, like COVID pneumonia with respiratory failure, mild to moderate ERDS, they would benefit from NIV. We should give a trial. But severe pneumonia with severe ERDS, uh, generally NIV tends to fail and there we go ahead and uh, possibly intubate. And NIV is shown to prevent recurrent respiratory failure and initiating NIV as soon as possible. So reducing the time lag for initiation is an important predictor of the success of NIV. But if you initiate NIV and there is no improvement in his clinical in, in condition in next, maybe next two to four hours, 
then maybe we have to go ahead and intubate. And most important, NIV is absolutely safe and it is uh, not invasive. And, uh, and uh, uh, the way our whole intensive care is revolutionized is lots and lots of lives are saved by NIV for many of the respiratory failures. And intubation is uh, seldom uh, sort of needed for mild to moderate. But for severe respiratory failure, of course, we need. So thank you very much. So I'll stop sharing the screen and I'll hand over to moderators. Thank you all. Hello, Sanish. Uh, yeah, Dr. Sunil, you can yeah. continue. Uh, it is my honor and uh, duty to present uh, Dr. Jose Chako. Uh, Dr. Jose Chako currently works as senior consultant, critical care at uh, Arana Health Bangalore. In, he has over 25 years of experience in teaching and training in critical care medicine. His key areas of interest include echocardiographic optimization of hemodynamic status, ultrasonography in critical care, renal replacement therapy in the ICU, and management of refractory hypoxia. He is a wind focused trainer for ultrasound and echocardiography for trainees in anesthesia, intensive care, and emergency medicine. He has several original publications in peer reviewed journals and has contributed to textbooks in critical care and emergency medicine. Over to Dr. Joe Thanks a lot, Sunil. I hope I'm audible, visible to you all. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You can proceed. Thank you so much. So you heard about non-invasive ventilation. We move on to a relatively new modality of respiratory support that has really come up in the last few years, particularly because of its favorable impact on acute hypoxemic respiratory failure high flow nasal oxygen. So we discussed this against the background of one of the worst ever pandemics in history. The novel coronavirus of 2019 has left a trail of destruction, devastation with nearly 56 million people affected all over the world, leaving 1.5 million dead. And the scenario in India is also, although we had a little bit of respite in the last couple of weeks, the numbers are fast approaching one crore with over 1.3 lakhs dead during the same period. So this pandemic really brings back memories of the worst ever pandemics accorded, like the, the bubonic plague or black death in the 14th century, the cholera epidemic in the 18th century in England, the Spanish flu of 20, uh, 1918, and the Asian flu in the 20th century, not so long ago. So against this background, when we look at COVID-19 particularly, and viral pneumonias in general, one of the key features is severe hypoxia that seems to be refractory to most modalities of treatment so much so that many of them go on to get intubated. And particularly in COVID-19, as you heard already, the outcomes seem to be very poor when you reach that stage. So what do you do? You use a variety of modalities to supplement oxygen, including masks, nasal cannulae, and so on. But the problem here is that, although these devices are definitely very much effective in offering supplemental oxygen support, they fall behind in several ways. First of all, in patients who are breathless, the peak inspiratory flow is usually very high. It is usually more than 100 liters per minute. And their minute volume or minute ventilation is also very high. And we all know that the maximal flow that we can get from our flow meters from the wall oxygen is 15 liters per minute. Although you can get slightly higher flows if you keep on cranking up the flow meter more and more open, you may get up to 20 liters per minute. That's something you can do actually by the bedside if your patient becomes profoundly hypoxic. If you keep on turning the rotometer, you can actually get a higher flow. Even if the bobbin doesn't move, it gets stuck at the roof. 
So, so at the most, you can give about 15 to 20 liters per minute, which is in no way a match for the peak flow requirement in a dyspneic patient, which is for the order of 100 liters per minute. So the flows do not match the requirement in this situation. And when the flows do not match the requirement, the FiO2 that you deliver will also be highly variable. The rough rule of thumb through a nasal prong is that for every one liter flow, you increase FiO2 by 4%. But this would remain just a rule of thumb because in real life, you don't get anything like this, particularly in a patient who is severely dyspneic with high peak inspiratory flows. So although you're able to supplement the oxygen, they do not meet the flows that are required in a patient who is very dyspneic. And very often, unfortunately, they fail this kind of treatment. So this is the place where high flow nasal cannula has taken a very important place. This machine essentially comprises of a, a flow generating motor, which can generate up to 60 liters per minute. You can vary the FiO2 by attaching the oxygen to the machine or using a blender device. It varies from machine to machine. And then you deliver this oxygen through a corrugated tube. And the most important aspect of this tube is that it is embedded with heated wires inside. So you heat the gas, you warm the gas to body temperature or near body temperature and you pass it through this tubing, which is wire embedded, which preserves the temperature and humidity. So you deliver oxygen that is 100% humidified, set to the level of temperature that you require, usually 35 to 37 degrees Celsius. And you deliver a flow of up to 60 liters per minute. So that's how it results in a major advantage for the patient. Now, what are the other effects it has? When you apply the high flow nasal cannula at a flow of say 60 liters per minute or thereabouts, it fills the upper airway dead space with the gas or fresh gas that you deliver through the cannula. So this displaces the carbon dioxide present in the upper airway, which is part of the anatomical dead space. So in effect, you are reducing the dead space and you are increasing the alveolar ventilation. So essentially flushing off the carbon dioxide from the dead space results in a lower carbon dioxide, improved alveolar ventilation. And this can lead to a reduction in the respiratory rate and increase in the comfort level of the patient. The other effect that high flow nasal cannula will have is by offering some level of positive and expiratory pressure. This has been studied in postoperative subjects and it varied from roughly 1.5 to about three centimeters of water. It's by no means the kind of peep that you can offer through a NIV device, but certainly there will be some peep effect there. And this peep effect will help to improve the end expiratory lung volume some degree of recruitment and some degree of improvement of the functional residual capacity, which might improve oxygenation in, in addition to the improvement in oxygenation purely from FiO2 increase. The other important factor that I already mentioned is because the gas is completely humidified, it facilitates ciliary function, secretion clearance first, and secondly, Humidification is an energy expending process wherein the body requires calories to humidify the inspired gas. So when you offer pre-humidified gases, it conserves energy and that may reduce the work of breathing as well. So these are the theoretical advantages of oxygen delivery through a high flow nasal cannula. There are several devices I must say beforehand that I have no conflict of interest whatsoever in any of these devices, but the common ones used are the AirVo machines 
And there is a new device which I haven't used myself that has been in use around the world called Vapor Therm. And there are different variations of these devices. And of course, we have seen extensive use during the COVID pandemic right throughout the country. Now, all that is very good. How does it really work out in acutely hypoxemic patients? Is it of any use? Has it been really studied? There have been many studies, particularly in patients with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. And one of the early studies which really showed that high flow nasal cannula may be helpful is a study by Frat et al. in which they specifically looked at intubation rates with high flow nasal cannula versus NIV in acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. And they found no difference in the rate of intubation with the use of high flow nasal cannula, which is the primary outcome. However, they found that the use of high flow nasal cannula resulted in a, an improved 90 day survival compared to standard oxygen therapy or non-invasive ventilation. So this is one of the first studies that showed mortality may improve, although it was a secondary endpoint, not the primary endpoint. It showed a signal that high flow nasal cannula therapy as the first line therapy may result in improved survival compared to standard therapy or non-invasive ventilation in patients with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. This study also showed that the ventilator-free days are also significantly higher with the use of high flow nasal cannula compared to non-invasive ventilator support or the use of standard supplemental oxygen. So this is one of the early studies that did establish that it is useful in patients with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure as first line therapy and maybe even more advantages than non-invasive ventilation or any other form of oxygen supplement. There have been many studies in different circumstances after this, which most of which have corroborated the findings of this particular paper by Frat et al. Now the most important question, particularly relevant to our times, does high flow nasal cannula therapy work in viral pneumonias? How does it help patients with bilateral extensive infiltrates, extensive consolidation as we see on the CT scans? And does it really help improve outcomes in such patients? One of the concerns has been, in fact, the early recommendations by some of the bodies across the world suggested that you perhaps should be very cautious with the use of high flow nasal cannula in patients with COVID-19 and other viral pneumonias because of aerosol dispersion all around the patient, which might increase the transmission risk to healthcare workers. But this has been studied systematically. And the good news is that the use of high flow nasal cannula does not seem to disperse aerosols any more than a standard nasal cannula or the commonly used masks. And it's definitely much lower than NIV or the use of nebulizers. So the risk of transmission to healthcare workers and aerosol dispersion distance, which is what they studied, is favorable with the use of high flow nasal cannula. And there is not much particularly concerning in terms of transmission to healthcare workers. And we have this study by Rello et al, which was a subgroup study of another major study in acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, in which they studied specifically patients with H1N1 pneumonia, which has many similarities to COVID-19 pneumonia. And they studied 35 patients in whom they tried high flow nasal cannula among 20 patients nine of whom escaped intubation. And most importantly, they found that there was no transmission risk to the healthcare workers involved. So this is one of the early studies with H1N1 that suggested that you can safely use high flow nasal cannula in viral pneumonias, and it might also help in reducing the requirement for intubation among these patients. Of course, it has been studied to a limited extent in MERS as well, but uh, the outcomes have not particularly been looked at. Now, most importantly, 
does this modality help in patients with COVID-19, which is staring us in the face today, causing destruction, devastation across the country and across the world? As I mentioned, initially, the thought process was that you shouldn't use an IV, you shouldn't use high flow nasal cannula and similar devices because of the risk of aerosol dispersion. So our colleagues from China, they started using it first because they were hit first by this pandemic. And they tried in Wuhan, they used high flow nasal cannula as initial therapy among their patients. In the, one of the first studies, there were 318 patients who were uh, admitted with COVID-19. 27 had respiratory failure, and they used high flow in 17 patients. And 10 of these patients escaped escalation of respiratory support. And one of the very important findings was that in patients with relatively milder disease with a PF ratio of more than 200, there was no requirement for escalation of respiratory support with high flow nasal cannula. And among patients with a PF ratio of less than 200, 63% of them required escalation of respiratory support. So this was one of the leading or early studies that suggested that high flow nasal cannula can be used effectively as initial therapy for COVID-19 patients and the risk of transmission may not be very high. Subsequently, there have been several other studies. Patel et al, this is actually from Pennsylvania in the US. They studied 104 patients with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure in whom they used high flow nasal cannula and 67 out of these patients escaped invasive ventilation. And they also found that the, the in-hospital mortality was considerably lower, significantly lower among patients who were administered high flow nasal cannula therapy as the initial line of therapy compared to patients who are not. So this study again suggested that the use of high flow nasal cannula may be an appropriate line of initial therapy among severely hypoxemic patients with COVID-19. We had a bigger study from Italy by Franco et al. In fact, this is again an observational study which looked at patients who received high flow nasal cannula versus CPAP versus BiPAP. There was no significant difference in the 30 day mortality, nor was there any difference in the intubation requirements among these three groups of patients. So, this study again showed that high flow nasal cannula may be effective as first line therapy in patients with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure with COVID-19. Just as we heard with NIV, one of the most important factors that you need to bear in mind is when do you say enough is enough and escalate therapy to say NIV or intubate them. This step is extremely crucial. We've had many patients not only in our hospital, in other hospitals as well, across the country, maybe across the world as well, wherein because of lack of trained staff, patients were on high flow for an extended period of time and they deteriorated to the point that they suffered significant harm. So that's something that you need to be very much wary about. So bedside vigilance cannot be overemphasized. You need somebody by the bedside to ensure that your patient is okay throughout, be it high flow nasal cannula or be it an IV. And you need to be sure to identify patients who are not responding appropriately. So if indeed your patient is responding, there will be an improvement in oxygen saturation, their blood gases will improve, the PCO2 may also become lower, there will be amelioration of the tachypnea, the respiratory rates will come down significantly. And in many patients, if they have thoracoabdominal asynchrony, that will also become much better with the use of high flow nasal cannula. So these are some of the things that you would look for very keenly by the bedside to ensure that your patient is indeed doing okay on high flow nasal cannula. One of the other 
objective methods to identify patients who may require escalation is the use of what's called the ROX index. This is a very simple index, easy to calculate by the bedside. In fact, we have not been doing this. Perhaps we should do soon. It is the ratio of the SpO2 FiO2 ratio divided by the respiratory rate. So to give you an example, if your patient is saturating 100% on an FiO2 of 0.5, so that'll be 100 divided by 0.5 is 200 divided by 20, the respiratory rate. So 200 by 20 will give you a ROCS index of 10. And the early studies by Roca et al have shown that a ROCS index of more than 4.33 at 24 hours of use of high flow nasal cannula was a strong predictor of a favorable response. So the higher the index, the better it is. If it is more than 4.33 at 24 hours, there is a strong possibility that your patient may be okay. So that is the magic number that you look for. Subsequently, specifically in COVID-19 patients, a South African study looked at the ROCS index at six hours, and they this is actually shorter than the 24-hour ROCS index that was described initially by the by the, the same authors who described the index. So in this paper, they looked at the six hour ROX index among patients who are on high flow nasal cannula, and they found that the six hour ROX index of more than 3.7 was a strong predictor of success with high flow nasal cannula. Success means not requiring to be intubated, obviously. And a ROX index of less than 2.2 strongly suggested failure, 74% chance of failure. And a higher ROX index at six hours compared to baseline was also predictive of success. So that is something objective for you to go by when you're using high flow nasal cannula. So to wind up, high flow nasal cannula results in the delivery of flows of the order of 40 to 60 liters per minute in many of the devices that we have currently. And these high flows are more in tune with the requirements of patients who are severely breathless, wherein their flow, inspiratory flow rates may be as high as 100 liters per minute. And this devices, these devices warm the gas as well as humidify the gas which helps in ciliary activity, clearing of secretions, and reduces the energy expenditure for humidification as well. Several studies have borne strong testimony to the fact that high flow devices are effective in patients with acute hypoxic respiratory failure. And many observational studies, of course, there has been no randomized controlled trial in COVID-19 comparing high flow versus standard therapy. It's unlikely that we will have any such study in the near future. But observational studies I mentioned have consistently shown that it is effective as a first line therapy among patients with COVID-19. And needless to emphasize, bedside vigilance and close monitoring of the patient to identify those who respond versus those who may require escalation of support is the key to successful therapy with high flow nasal cannula. The US is seeing surge after surge after surge to the point that they have something like 160,000 cases per day as we speak. In India, we have seen a respite in the last several weeks. The curve seems to be on a downhill slope, which is a good sign. Hopefully, it will continue to slide down because we certainly cannot go very far if it keeps rising. And hopefully, we won't have yet another surge like they're experiencing in other parts of the world. Thank you. Thanks very much.